Hello and welcome to the Six Advanced Super Curricular Lecture on Philosophy for Beginners. I'm Ken Walton um, and I'm a teacher of Religion, Ethics and Philosophy. So, what is philosophy all about? That's what I want to look at uh, to start with and then we'll look at um, two uh, the greatest philosophers of all time uh, and how their work has impacted how we think. So what I want us to think about first is if we were to define the following words, how would we define them? What do they mean? What do these words mean? What does the word human mean to you? How would you define rational? Educate? Legal? Words need to be broken down. And for each of those words um, that appeared on the screen, many of us will have come up with very different interpretations and understandings. We would have defined them differently. We would have different perspectives, depending on how um, we live, what we've learnt, um, who we've listened to, how we understand the world around us. Every one of those words will have had very different meanings. And philosophy is about breaking down what we mean about things. It's about establishing a justification for what we believe in and why we believe in it. Digging deeper, questioning, doubting, believing. That's what philosophy is about at its very core. If you wanted to study uh, philosophy at university there's all sorts of different angles um, and on the screen there on the right hand side of the screen you can see the different uh, topics uh, that can be covered if you were to study philosophy at university so it's about digging deeper questioning doubting and trying to understand what we believe in all these different areas of life what does the word uh, philosophy actually mean well, it's taken from the two Greek words, uh, philo mean, uh, meaning uh, the lover of things and sophia meaning wisdom. So all philosophy actually means is that you're a lover of wisdom, you're a lover of words and of life and what life is teaching us and what life should be about. And that's all that philosophy is. One of the uh, most important um, philosophers from the late 19th and early 20th century uh, was Wittgenstein, uh, who was born in Austria and went to school with another very famous uh, person. And there's a, a copy of the school photograph for you on the screen. And Wittgenstein was very much little translations of words or phrases just do not work. Wittgenstein said that all our language, everything that we say, everything we do, uh, is actually just a game and we play games with the words that we use what kinds of games do you play with the words that you speak and maybe you will not be able to fully inter interpret that because actually it's the listener it's the person who hears what you're saying uh, and is impacted by your words that probably understands the game more than you do this is how you develop your philosophy for life um, because Wittgenstein said it was living, breathing, thinking, criticising, reasoning, doubting and justifying everything that we think and say and speak and believe. So what's your philosophy? How do you interpret the world around you? Uh, and every one of us have very different understandings of, of how the world works and what the world means and, and what it's trying to achieve and what life and the meaning of life is all about. Uh, you know, some people, let's just chill, let's just relax, you know, whatever. Um, but then Greta Thunberg, you know, school strikes for climate change. That's what her message, that's what her uh, worldview is all about, based upon some deep held beliefs that climate is killing uh, the very planet that we live on. What is your worldview? How do you interpret this world that we live in? 
but you can't just believe anything. You can't just say, right, well, I'm going to believe this, uh, this, this, and this about the world. There's got to be logic, and philosophy is about logical arguments put forward uh, to uh, help us understand what we mean about uh, a worldview and our understanding of uh, the meaning of life. And there are two um, two clear arguments uh, put before you on the screen. So one on the left-hand side, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, is an example of a logical argument. Um, if all men are mortal and live forever, and we know that Socrates was a man, then it is logical to conclude that Socrates is mortal. And on the right-hand side of the screen, we have a typical argument that doesn't follow logic, that is illogical uh, and doesn't actually work. And so what philosophy tries to teach you is, yeah, let's have a world view, but it's got to be logical. It's got to follow on. The argument has to be coherent and whole. A good example, again, of uh, an argument that somebody might put forward. I've invented an amazing new sedative which makes people faster and more excited. Logical or illogical? Obviously, it's illogical because a sedative is something that makes you sleepy and drowsy. Uh, and so, therefore, it's the opposite of faster and more excited. So, it's an illogical argument. So, your argument has to be coherent and logical. So let's have a look at some of these very famous philosophers. Um, philosophy is built upon principles, and there are three questions that um, a philosopher will be asking themselves, uh, and this is where the, how they will put forward their logical argument. The first thing they want to know is, what is the true nature of reality? Then how can this reality be known? And how uh, should we live given that true nature of reality? In other words, number three is, how does my beliefs and ideas about the world and the reality of the world impact upon me as a person? Plato was a very famous philosopher, uh, going back to ancient uh, Greece, um, several hundred years before Christ. Um, and we're just going to have a look at how does he answer those three questions. So that first question is, well, what is the true nature of reality? And the way that Plato answered that question would be to ask, what is a perfect circle? How do we know what a perfect circle looks like? Can we draw a perfect circle? Now, of course, they didn't have the apparatus that we do in order to be able to create an absolute exact perfect circle. We have to remember to get back into Plato's worldview, uh, where he didn't have uh, the sophisticated equipment that we have. Um, Plato would certainly argue that everything that we know about the world today was given to us um, in a previous life. Because previous to this life, we all lived in the world of forms. There is a world of forms beyond us and outside of our reality. And within that world of forms is the perfect form of everything. There is the perfect model of a chair. There is the perfect model of a table. There is the perfect circle. And also leaning upon his friend Pythagoras, he also said there are perfect forms of numbers uh, in this world of forms. And we have all of that information in our subconscious mind. And we are able at times to release that information that help us to understand the reality of what we are living in today. So what's the true nature of reality? Well, everything, uh, according to Plato, in this world is mere shadows. And one of the very famous uh, philosophical um, arguments is Plato's uh, analogy of the cave. And as you can see on the picture here, uh, we have a cave and we have at the very bottom of the cave um, sat on a step, the prisoners. And the prisoners are trapped there looking up 
um, at the wall. And all they see on the wall are these shadows. And they sit there all day and they just look at the shadows. Are the shadows real? Are the shadows actual reality? No, they're only shadows. They are shadows that have been created, as you can see from the rest of the picture of the cave, by uh, the hole in the cave, the door in the cave, where it says they're sent to sunlight. And you can see uh, the cave door and the light shining through there is showing shadows of the people who are hidden from the prisoners, but above them in front of the fire. But the prisoners don't know that. The prisoners are sat there saying, oh, look at those uh, images on the wall. This is lovely. This is reality. They know no difference. They don't know any different. Why should they? A, a good analogy of that would probably be to people who um, sit in front of television watching programmes like uh, Jeremy Kyle uh, and uh, we look at the people and the images that are being projected to us from our television screens and we believe it to be reality if we do not know any different if we do not go beyond our front room and our television screen and this is what the prisoners are they are trapped in this cave they see these shadows in these images and they think that is reality and what plato says is that's not true reality Reality is if we climb up these steps at the side of the wall, up to where it says diffuse sunlight, and then carry on up out of the door, and we're like the man who is outside of the cave. That's true reality. We can see everything for what it actually really is. And the only way we can do that is, according to Plato, open our mind to philosophy, open our mind to understanding the world around us, understanding what is real. It is the philosopher who opens our minds to what is true and what is real, according to Plato. So the second question that was asked about philosophers was, well, how can this reality be known? Well, part of what we call within philosophy is epistemology. And this is the branch of philosophy that investigates what knowledge is. And what knowledge is not? What is it to know? How would you define knowledge? Well, for Plato, he would say knowledge is something that you can fully 100% justify. And he would argue that knowledge is all a priori. And a priori is a Latin for logic, that actually everything is logical. One plus one equals two. That's uh, an a priori argument because it's logical, it's true, it's fact. And you look at the conclusion of it, it's 100% true. As opposed to the other Latin phrase, a posteriori, which actually means based upon experience. And if something's based upon experience, we're not necessarily going to sort of say it's 100% accurate because everyone's experience is different. So Plato would say all knowledge is based upon logic, 100% a priori logic. Once you've sorted out all that, and you've sort of said, well, yes, um, philosophy is the key to life. Philosophy opens our minds. Uh, we need to get uh, to understand the, the nature of reality itself. And we know the nature of reality because it would be based upon logic. Um, and as long as it's based upon a priori logic, uh, then it is truthful and it's factual. But the third question was, well, how does that impact your life? How should I live given that true nature of reality? Well, for a minute, let's just step back before we say what Plato actually uh, defined uh, as being good. Um, but what does good actually mean? You know, because this if, if something's going to impact your life, if it's going to be an ethical base for your life, then it's got to be about leading a good life. But what does that mean? What does it actually mean to be good? Well, let's first of all look at what Plato rejects about what is good. Plato rejects the divine command theory. And the divine command theory, as you can see from the picture on the left-hand side of the screen, Moses from the Old Testament in the Bible receiving the Ten Commandments from God. So some people would say, well, goodness, is actually following these Ten Commandments. Uh, but Plato wants to reject that because actually 
is that true? Does everybody follow the Ten Commandments? Uh, and not just the Ten Commandments, because there were over 670 commandments given to Moses at the time. And some of those commandments uh, are on the right-hand side of the screen. And these commandments said, you can't eat a cheeseburger because you can't eat meat and dairy products together. Well, big no-no. Black pudding would be also banned because one of the commandments given to Moses in the whole list of 670 odd uh, laws that he was given was you shouldn't be eating pig's blood and black pudding is just pig's blood. You shouldn't also eat shellfish. So Plato rejects this whole idea that there is this external force that's given us a list of rules. He also rejects what we call deontological ethics um, because Deontological is we live by universal laws. We live by the same laws and everybody lives uh, under the same umbrella. Um, the rules should be applied to everybody and everybody should know what the rules are. But we can't because uh, at least Plato even recognises we have different cultures and clash of cultures. Uh, consider the picture on the uh, right. Some uh, countries and some cultures will say that marriage should be between one man and one woman. Some cultures say um, that um, people who are homosexual or lesbian should be able to marry too. Uh, but also, some people believe uh, in different cultures, you can have as many wives as you want. So how can we have universal rules and universal laws? So Plato rejects that idea because it doesn't fit in either to his uh, thinking and his philosophy and world view. What he also rejects is teleological ethics. And teleological ethics is, rather than based upon rules, you're looking at the consequences, as long as the consequences are good, um, as long as the majority of people uh, enjoy the consequences, then you, you've hit the right note. Well, the majority of Germans at the time were accepting of what Adolf Hitler were doing. And so Plato saw the downside uh, to consequential uh, ethics. So what does Plato actually say? And what does Plato actually mean when he talks about uh, the impact of his philosophy and his worldview upon life? Well, his answer to question number one um, on metaphysics was that actually there are perfect forms of everything that are buried within our subconscious from a, a previous world, the world of forms. So those perfect forms. His epistemology was that we have to actually understand a perfect knowledge and the perfect knowledge comes from a priori statements and so therefore for ethics to follow on to have a logical argument for it to be a coherent uh, discussion that plato puts forward his ethics is also we must lead the perfect life we must make the perfect decision in everything that we do Now, one would think we've wrestled with all the questions and understood the world. But then along came this guy. Uh, he was French, a mathematician, but basing everything because of his mathematical background on logic. He puzzled over everything. His name, René Descartes. And Descartes um, said, we should doubt everything. What about these questions here? True or false? Is Reykjavik the capital of Iceland? Now, before you answer this, you need to make sure that I haven't photoshopped the actual map that is on the uh, screen, because actually I've put Reykjavik there uh, and I've highlighted it. I've put it in bold capitals. Have a think before you answer the question. Have I just tried to manipulate you by uh, photoshopping the map? Henry VIII had six wives, and this is one thing that we all have... Um, difficulty remembering sometimes. Did Henry VIII have six wives? He was Henry VIII, so did he have eight wives? Could you name all six wives if he had six wives? Be sure he did not have five wives. How many did he actually have? Did he not actually uh, marry one of them? Was the one that uh, he didn't marry? Is Donald Trump the President of the United States of America? Who knows? Donald Trump thinks he's the President of the United States of America. Does anybody else? 
what I've tried to do is try to make sure that you can question everything because that is what philosophy is about, but also raising little doubts in your mind. Descartes' great brainwave has transformed philosophy ever since. You cannot be certain of anything except one thing. The reason you cannot be certain is, according to Descartes, that some things are hallucinations and optical illusions. Sometimes, like the Matrix, everything appears to be real, but actually, is it? What is reality? And if anybody's actually watched The Matrix, you're taken into this totally alternative world um, and everything is doubted. Everything you thought you knew about yourself is laid bare and questioned. The only one thing that you can be certain of is this. The Latin phrase again, cognito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. And what Descartes was actually arguing here was that you can doubt everything. I can doubt uh, uh, that somebody else exists. I could doubt that uh, this table in front of me actually exists. The chair, does it really exist? Am I not just an a hallucination, an optical illusion myself? Isn't life just some kind of dream world? Um, we can doubt everything. But there's one thing we can't doubt. And that is our ability to think. Because the minute we doubt we're thinking, we're actually thinking. And so, I think, therefore I am, was Descartes' very famous phrase to sum up that that is what our world view is based upon, our ability to think and to reason. So, a beginner's guide to philosophy. Um, use your logic use your free speech to create a coherent philosophy to follow in your own life. What is the true nature of reality? What is real about this world? Then have a think. How can this reality be known? Plato said through logic. Descartes said through the ability to think. And thirdly, how does that impact on the way that you live? What are the consequences of your world view on how you live out your life? And there we have a beginner's guide to philosophy and what it's all about, some of the famous people, but more importantly, how you can now apply that to your own life, to your own situation and to your own thinking. Thank you.